What I would definitely love to have is a very short one minute kind of elevator pitch, uh, uh, precise and concise and, and pithy way to describe cryonics to the average lay person uh, such, such that, you know, they might actually be interested. They might want to learn more, uh, which, which, uh, perhaps is, is kind of hard to do, but you're probably the best person in the world, literally to do this. So how, how would you, how would you do it? Give us your one minute. One minute concise and incisive. Wow. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Cryonics is essentially an extension of emergency medicine. What we do is essentially when today's medicine gives up on a patient because it's reached the limits of today's capabilities, we say rather than just disposing of that person, turn them over to us, we're going to stabilize them, stop them getting worse, and then put them in stasis using very cold temperatures so that they can go into the future when we'll have much more advanced capabilities and have a chance of repairing whatever damage caused the, their lives to stop and then bring them back to life, essentially. And I say bring back to life, but in our view, they're not really truly dead. Just as if you go back to 1960, uh, somebody back then, if they stopped breathing, their heart stopped beating, they would have been declared dead. Today, we don't do that. We say, we need to do something soon or else this person will die. Uh, they've clinically died, but we can resuscitate them. So in our view, when people are declared legally dead today, that really just means doctors have thrown up their hands and said, we don't know what else to do. But the future will have much more capability. So our job is to stabilize and take them to the future where they'll have another chance. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, for giving us that. So in your in your short pitch you don't tend to go into anything like how it you know how it's not as expensive as people think or or uh, uh, the actual temperature of liquid you know, you know, there's several things that you sort of left out that um, oh, yeah. we only have one minute <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no I yep. can definitely add on to those um, yeah so a bit more there's kind of three main steps to the process I mean not counting you know, making all the financial and contractual arrangements so once you've been uh, once you're at a point where your body's probably going to give out and we hope to have advanced warning, which we do in many cases, we will send a standby team out to literally stand by at your bedside until legal death has been declared. Now, in the current legal situation, we have to wait for that point. You can't just, well, there are some states, of course, where you can choose within six months of the end to decide when you go, which is actually very helpful. We've done two cases like that now, so we can actually schedule when we do this. But generally, we have to wait until legal death has been declared. And then we can immediately go into action. We move the patient from the bed to an ice bath uh, we cover them with lots of ice and icy water, and we circulate that around the patient because it's a lot faster cooling than just dumping ice on top of somebody. We use a mechanical CPR device to restart circulation, pumping on the chest uh, and a ventilator. And you might think that's kind of an odd thing for someone who's been declared dead, that we're restarting circulation and, and, uh, and ventilation. But the reason is we have to accelerate the cooling. If you just if you don't have any circulation, the body's not going to cool very quickly. So that's one reason. The other reason is to give various medications to protect the cells against the damage that starts happening once the body is dysfunctional. So antacids, membrane stabilizers, uh, anticoagulants, that kind of thing. So this first step is very much, it's quite familiar in hospitals. They kind of get this because it's very much like donating organs, uh, except rather than donating a heart or a kidney, you're essentially transferring all your organs to yourself in the future in a way. Uh, so hospitals kind of get this part. Now this part we have to do very quickly because obviously the hotter you are, the warmer you are at body temperature, things are gonna fall apart quite quickly. In fact, there's a, a thing called the Q10 rule, which says basically for every 10 degrees C reduction in temperature, metabolism slows down by 50%. So if you can get it down 30 degrees, you're going to be uh, falling apart basically eight, uh, eight, eight times more slowly. So it buys us more time. And this is why they do low temperature surgery these days, especially for brain surgery. So at this stage, we are trying to get down close to zero uh, as quickly as we can. And we're going to transport the patient here to alcohol, which may be in an emergency vehicle if it's an Arizona case or be on a plane if it's further distance. And once they reach our operating room here, we'll bring in one of our contract surgeons. Uh, let's just take a whole body case for simplicity. They'll do essentially a median stenotomy, open up the chest, access the major blood vessels of the heart, and then uh, put, connect that to us, our pump and chiller system and we're gonna have an open circuit that's essentially circulating through the device, replacing the blood gradually with a cryoprotectant solution. And by a cryoprotectant, I really just mean a medical grade antifreeze. This is something that's been designed actually specifically for storing human organs for reversible cryopreservation, which we're very, very close to achieving. Um, it's you know, the lowest toxicity cryoprotectant available, but you have to introduce it fairly gradually because you don't wanna put it in at full concentration while someone's still relatively warm. But by the end of about three or four hours, we will have replaced as much of the uh, blood and body fluids as possible with this cryoprotectant solution. Then we can go into the next part of that second stage, which is to 
plummet the body temperature below freezing and having protected the cells, no ice should be formed or very little ice will be formed. And we really don't want ice because it's pretty nasty stuff. It's got sharp edges that poke into cell membranes. It doesn't blow them up contrary to what some people have said. Uh, some people even should do better. Uh, it doesn't do that. Actually, the cells will dehydrate and the cells will shrink and then the ice will form outside them and poke into the membrane. So it doesn't blow them up, but it does damage them. So we want to minimize that kind of damage. While we do require more advanced technology of the future, we don't want to rely on the future for everything. We're going to minimize the damage we're doing today. That's the proper way to do cryonics. So at that point, we go down to about minus 90 degrees C very rapidly. And then we slow down as we move into the third stage. Uh, now at cryogenic temperatures, once you get past about minus 110 degrees C, you turn essentially from a bag of very cold fluids into a true solid. And you don't want to go down in temperature too quickly from that point because different tissues will contract at different rates and you can get fracturing. So we slow down to about one degree C per minute until we reach the final resting temperature of minus 196 degrees C or for Americans, minus 320 Fahrenheit. And that's pretty darn cold. You know, your, your freezer compartment in your fridge is about minus 20. It's good for keeping food fresh for a few months. At minus 320, you can wait essentially thousands of years and you'll be just as fresh as when you started. So those are the three stages to get someone cryopreserved. Then of course, there's a whole, a whole scenario of how do you revive them, which you know, is something we can talk about separately perhaps.